The streak is over. Or for Boston College fans, they hope that a new streak has begun. BC defeats UMass 26-7. We bring in Dan Rubin from Eagles Unlimited on bceagles.com to help us out with this one. Dan, and the first thing that comes to mind that for the first time in, you can probably recite the number of days during football season, New England football fans can be happy on Sunday, even before the Patriots win. 350 days to be exact. I think if you include yesterday, it would have been 351 uh, since Boston College last won a regular season college football game. Uh, last win came September 25th or 6th, I think it was, last year. It was 24, 26, something like that, um, over Northern Illinois. But it didn't feel good. Uh, it, was the, it was the first game of a quarterback rotation. It, it was kind of the, the slippery slope last year. Yesterday, down at Gillette, under the watchful eyes of the Dark Knight protector, Tom Brady himself, uh, with the big banner overlooking uh, Gillette Stadium, Boston College beat UMass. The de facto state champs didn't really come as a surprise. I mean, I think a lot of people expected a win, but uh, the way they went about winning it made you feel a lot better. It was a slow start, kind of a tough start. Uh, the first quarter was tough. You're losing at the end of the first quarter, 7 to nothing to... UMass, but after that, it was just all BC. They they made a couple of adjustments, really got after the quarterback, and, and flat out dominated. And when you run down the stat line, it, it was it was not a pretty day for for UMass, and that is something that will make Boston College fans feel really good. And we'll do just that because the results different, but the rock solid defense not different. That's the one thing that didn't change. Eight first downs for UMass, 122 total yards. And for most of the country that thinks they play the best defense in the SEC, yeah, UMass only scored seven points last week against Florida in Gainesville, but generated quite a bit more offense against the Gators than they did against the Eagles yesterday. Yeah, and and, and the thing is, is that that score for UMass in the first quarter was a busted coverage, tight end got open, uh, 58 yards to pay dirt, and it's, a, and it's a touchdown, UMass is in the lead. It was just Total busted coverage. It was a bad play by the defense, and, and it resulted in a uh, in a touchdown. If you look beyond the stat line and you look into the rest of that game, Ross Comas, who's the quarterback for UMass, only threw for 57 yards in quarters two through four. So you look at, at what BC was able to do. They sacked him eight times. Uh, Comas needed to get a little help from the training staff and, an, and probably an ice bath after the game. Um, he was slow to get up a couple of times. There were some really big hits. And, you know, when you're running for negative 23 yards rushing, uh, that's a sign that your offensive line is not having its best day. So it's a good sign for Boston College fans because a lot of people were worried changing the coordinator that there was going to be a change in defense. Steve Adazio instead has kind of flipped it around and said, you know, it's his defense. He really wanted a guy who could come in and replicate that defense, not change it up. Like So his two coordinators – are the same mindset going from Don Brown to Jim Reed. And uh, people got a taste of that. They, you know, you look at the eight sacks, three turnovers, you're plus two in the turnover category. And it's really just a good day to be a Boston College fan when you get to see your defense like that. Because the offense, I mean, the offense didn't light the world on fire, but the offense was improved enough that if they play like that, they're going to be a, an incredibly tough out and may be able to pick off a couple of games uh, in, in conference, pick up some wins later in the season. I'm not going to say they're going to go undefeated the rest of the way, but, you know, that's something to build on. And, and when you look at progression, it was a good day yesterday. It wasn't the best, definitely wasn't the worst. It was a good day. You talked uh, in week one after the game, Dan, about Jeff Smith uh, impressing you with route running and with what he was able to do. Uh, but he even in, uh, increased on that with almost 100 yards receiving yesterday. Yeah, it was in, in 82 yards came on back-to-back -back plays. Um, two touchdown receptions. That, I mean, Jeff Smith, we knew at, at Boston College how fast he was and that it would translate. He was recruited as an athlete. It would, it would translate tremendous to the passing game. Uh, he, he had such a fantastic day yesterday. Um, the two touchdown passes, it, it you're losing 7 nothing late in the second quarter, 4.40 to go in the quarter. Uh, Patrick Tolles, they, they come out of a three and out, and Tolles decides to go deep. And, and Jeff Smith just flat out runs across the field and goes from the right side, runs across the hash box, catches it 40-something yards, and winds up with a touchdown. 
on the next drive, you get a turnover. It's a fumble. You wind up on the 36-yard line of UMass, and you do it again. Just go deep, pitch and catch, a nice little post route. He just goes, runs across the field, dusts the defensive back, and comes down with it in the end zone. And now he's got two touchdown catches on two consecutive plays. You go from a 7 nothing deficit to a 13-7 uh, advantage going into the locker room. It's a very big deal when you can have a guy like that who can fly. Dan, we talked about uh, Patrick Tolls a number of times during the off season and what he was able to produce at Kentucky and how it would translate. And now that you've got to see him two uh, games uh, before we hit the record button, we talked a little bit about the positives and negatives. So at least after two games, it seems like you got a pretty good handle on what you've got at quarterback, both uh, positively and negatively. Yeah, Patrick Toll's the type of guy. I don't. I don't necessarily think he's he's ever going to go out and win a Heisman Trophy for you. Uh, I, I don't think he's he's going to take over a game that way. But his leadership was evident yesterday. Your running game is not where it's supposed to be uh, after a couple of games. Steve Adazio out, outwardly said in the post game press conference that he wants his running game at about 200 yards per game. However, you have to get to that. You get to that. They weren't anywhere remotely close to that. So you have to put the ball in Toll's hands and say, make something happen. He connects on those two on those two long balls. Let me tell you, he has beyond the shadow of a doubt one of the best cannons I've ever seen. I mean, he's just got. He just, if he steps into a pass and launches it, that ball can can fly. It's a, it's incredible. Um, he's got speed. He's got quickness. You know, he's your, your leading rusher yesterday with 66 yards on 12 carries. Um, he can scramble. He's a big dude to be able to do that too. Six foot five, 250 pounds. So he comes as advertised from Kentucky. Now the the downside to him is he threw an interception yesterday where honestly he looked into double coverage with a third guy trailing and decided to try and thread the needle anyway. And he wound up with an interception. Is that poor decision-making or is that overconfidence in your stuff when things are going well? You know, Hey, it, it you're, you find me a quarterback that doesn't throw an interception over a 12 game, uh, 12 game schedule. I mean, they all do it at some point. Um, so he's definitely taking command of the offense. Got to like what you see out of him. Um, if you put the ball in his hands, he has played well enough in the first two games to put the team in the position to win. I think as the season goes on, you'll see him throw a little bit more. I don't ever think you're going to get razzle dazzle plays or trick plays out of this offense, but if you can line up in a pro style, line up four wide and give the ball to tolls in the last five minutes of a half. I think he's capable of putting points on the board. Dean, you weren't real happy with the offensive line from a run blocking standpoint after game one, I'm guessing from the John Hilleman performance of 22 carries for 54 yards that you alluded to long run of 15 and 22 attempts. You're probably not too happy now. Yeah, not great. Um, I mean, they, they've improved. There's definite positives, but they're not where they need to be and or where they probably should be at this point. Um, you know, you, you look at them and you look for progression, and, and that's kind of the, the, the stress word. That's the, the buzzword is progression through the first two games. They have progressed. Uh, Yardage-wise, they look very good getting yardage, but they left yards on the table. They left probably 60 to 70 yards of offense on the ground on the table in that game. And when you think to yourself, well, we threw for 191 yards as Boston College fans. They threw for two touchdowns. They were plus two. They won the game, and it could have been worse. I think that's for UMass, rather, it could have been better for BC. I think that just indicates how high the ceiling is on this team, at least uh, when you watch them and can kind of see how things are starting to gel. But a big part of it is going to be on the offensive line because on Saturday, now this week, they have to get ready for a team. You know, Georgia Tech, you're playing them triple option. You try to limit the amount of times you give them the ball. UMass, you killed them. I mean, there's no other way defensively. There's no other way around it. You're getting a Virginia Tech game that, if you're going to go in and win it down there in Blacksburg, you need your offensive line to uh, to take a step forward this week. I don't know at this point in the season, two games into it, if Tennessee's one of the best teams in the country, but I can pretty confidently say they're one of the more talented teams in the country. And Virginia Tech came out in front of 159,000 people at Bristol Speedway and punched them in the mouth with two touchdowns. Now, Tennessee eventually took the game over, but it took until almost the fourth quarter it was a competitive game. Tennessee wins by 21. So you're going to go to Virginia Tech. You're going to be a decided underdog. I don't think it's going to be anything overwhelming, probably anywhere from five points to a touchdown, possibly something in that range. But with that defense and with Virginia Tech, 
uh, and a new quarterback, even though they've got Isaiah Ford on the outside, one of the best in the ACC, if not the country, and Trayvon McMillan, a very exciting running back. You, you got a puncher's chance at least in this one. Yeah, and, and there's there's the other side of it too, where it's you know, where Scott Loeffler knows what he's going to get in the defense across the line from him. Uh, so that's it's going to be really interesting and compelling, I guess, to watch it from an ACC standpoint. Um, I think you know Boston College, you you can sense they should have won that first game. Uh, they they should have beaten Georgia Tech. They they beat UMass very handily. I think with the defense, it's okay to expect them to go in and handle the Virginia Tech offense, limit points keep them under 20. I don't think that's a reasonable, an unreasonable expectation given the way that they've played over the better part of last year in two games this year. Um, at the same time, I, I don't want to put a prediction on it because anything's possible in football, um, but I would like to see the offense uh, continue to get better in terms of its effectiveness. BC is never going to get into a shootout. They're not going to be a run up and down the field, put up as many points as you can on anybody but they need to get better and more efficient. That was definitely the, the theme on the first game. That's definitely the theme on the second game. They have to get more efficient in the red zone. They cannot leave points on the board. They're getting better. They connected on two field goals yesterday. They had a 40-yard field goal by Mike Knoll, who was, the, uh, who was a kicker the last couple of years and, and switched to punting this year. Your kicker from the Georgia Tech game is injured. He comes in, kicks two field goals, but he missed a PAT. He actually missed the PAT twice. Uh, the, the first time it was a false start and it was blocked. They did it again. And he still missed it. Uh, so there are areas where confidence is building. You can sense that they're getting better, but there's still enough where coaches have to go back to the film, break it down, look at this week, practice, and get ready to go down and play a very good team in a very hostile environment. It's going to be really interesting. You're either going to take a step backwards uh, or you're going to take the step forwards. I don't think you're going to stay status quo this week at all, though. So again, before stepping out of conference for two more games against Wagner and against Buffalo, it's uh, getting your feet wet back in ACC play and trying to steal one at Blacksburg against Virginia Tech. Yeah, it, 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 you think about what could have been. I, I know I was talking with one of my friends, and I said, if they beat Virginia Tech, they'll open up 4-1. and one. You know, it's the, it's the NC State theory. We used to talk about NC State scheduling four, uh, four a, a lighter schedule, group of five teams and FCS teams, and it spaces out so that you can get your rest, come back, and play the right team at the right time. You're one drive, one play away from being 2-0. and You win this week, you're up to 2-1, and and maybe Boston College is better than what people gave them credit for. It's not to take anything away from Georgia Tech at all last week, and it's certainly not to take anything away from Virginia Tech this week. But I think you win this game this week, and there will be a substantial hype if you're 4-1. and going into that game against Clemson on a Friday night. Not to get too far ahead of myself, though. He's still going to play on Saturday. Dan Rubin getting a set for a sneaky good matchup in Blacksburg with uh, BC traveling to Virginia Tech. Uh, Dan, we appreciate it. Hey, football's back. It's a beautiful thing.